This is Short-Term Rental Management, the show that is all about short-term rental property management with your host, yours truly, Luke Carl. Sell with the short-term shop. Are you looking to sell your short-term rental or even 1031 into a different property? Our team of realtors will work hard to get you the most for your investment. We are experts in our field and would love to earn your business. When it's time to sell, call the shop, theshorttermshop.com. That's theshorttermshop.com. Broker by EXP. Welcome to the program. Showtime. Showtime is short-term rental management uh, with uh, Cashflow Carl, the long hair extraordinaire. And today we've got uh, Kelsey, who is in uh, the the... Texas Beach area, Crystal Beach, Texas. Uh, she is an agent with the Short Term Shop but has uh, a couple of properties of her own. We're going to cover all sorts of topics today. Without further ado, uh, Kelsey, just uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little about a little bit about you and your current uh, real estate uh, portfolio. Hi, it's good to be here. Yes, uh, we uh, we were customers, my husband and I, of the Short Term Shop before I was an agent with the Short Term Shop. So we bought a cabin in the Smokies because it was clearly going well and we wanted to replicate that success like so many other people do. And then uh, Avery opened the Crystal Beach market and I wondered if she needed any help. And <laughs> since then, I've added a property in Crystal Beach. And um, so we have one in both markets. Okay. And um, yeah, so we've been doing this for about, we've had both our properties for about two years now. And been an agent with the short-term shop for about well, just less than that, a little over a year and a half. Okay, great. Uh, do you have any other uh, real estate? Any long-term rentals? Any uh, any uh, is or just the two the two short terms? No, just the two short terms. We originally uh, I got my license in order to buy investment properties for ourselves, thinking that we would do long-term rentals. And uh, just like so many other people, you know, my own clients and everybody else in the shop, they heard about the short-term shop and Avery Carl from bigger pockets. And it's uh, my favorite trope. <laughs> so and kind of the rest is history. So we switched gears and uh, haven't looked back. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. That's a, a good, good thing to hear. Um, that, uh, I mean, she, she, you know, she has a, a big reach and, uh, we're all very proud of her around here and she's changed a, a lot of lives and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that. So, uh, that's great. So let's talk about the, let's back up and talk about the cabin a little bit. Um, tell me, uh, you know, everything about it really, where, uh, like how big is it? Was it uh, how, you know, price range, uh, how, how much work did it need? All that kind of stuff. Okay, so this cabin, so a piece of advice I always give people is to not just have your agent set up a search for you, but to set up your own realtor.com search because they'll set you up a search for their uh, MLS. So it'll pull from the geographic area you want, but only if it's posted within that MLS. If you're looking on Zillow or realtor.com, <clears throat> it will pull from the geographic area no matter what MLS it's posted in. That's how we found our cabin. Uh, it was uh, it's close to Weirs Valley, but not in Weirs Valley. It's in Sevierville, about 15 minutes from Dollywood, 50 minutes west. And um, it was listed at 640. Uh, we got them down to 620. And this was at the height of the market. We bought it at the end of November. Not quite like it was it was crazy. We were bidding. I think at one point we bid. I can't even remember who was 50 or 100 K over asked. And we just on this one them. or a different one, different ones. So wait, you, we bid found this one. you went hundred K over ask on a property that you didn't get and still lost. Yeah. Lost it to a better offer. Uh, yes. Now looking back on that, like today that would not happen. Right. But, no. No. um, did they price it like that on purpose? Was it priced low? I don't even remember. It yeah. was kind of a blur. And at that time when you would offer, it'd be like you'd offer and you'd have all this, energy and time invested into finding it because it's just posted all the time, post all the time. So you're just going through your email and looking at each property, deciding what to offer. And it was this emotional roller coaster. So you get on the roller coaster, you wouldn't win. 
And then uh, I'd take like two days to recover and then we'd make another offer. Um, and we did that for a little while until we found this house and it had the worst pictures and it was listed as I was kind of alluding to, it was listed in the wrong MLS. So, um, yeah, it was listed by the neighbor's dad, who's a real estate agent, I think in Knoxville. Um, so yeah, so people, it wasn't on everyone's radar and the pictures were awful. Like they, they definitely weren't all taken at the same time. I don't know what where the pictures came from, but they were all blurry. Um, like, you know how most time people have like a hot tub and it'll be like, boom, there's the hot tub, maybe even a cheese plate. This is like, I didn't know there was a hot tub until I looked like through the railing. I was like, that's the side of a hot tub. Like there is a hot tub there. It was like hidden pictures trying to find what this house might actually look like in person. So it was, and then we got them down, I want to say 6k uh for the roof because the roof was old so i think we got in at six or eight i think we got it for six twelve and, and that was after the inspection yeah okay like final all said and done well i mean effectively six twelve we got seller contributions yeah avery preaches that all the time and the she, she's totally right you know i mean i would say that probably more than i would say that like probably more than 75 percent of the real estate that i own the listings were horrible. Um, and that's not to say that I've never bought a great, you know, beautiful listing. I have. Um, and I would say that even goes more, it holds more, even more true with a uh, regular old single family long-term just to get off topic already. Uh, because when you post a $150,000 long-term rental in, in, you know, uh, average Joe, Kentucky, USA, uh, if, the pictures are nice. You know, you got a lot of first time home buyers that are interested in that. They're, they're watching Chip and Joanna. They're watching HGTV every night and, and they want that little cute little dream home to raise their kids. And, and first impression is everything, you know? So yeah. uh, dare I say that in that asset class, that's even a bigger deal. Uh, because if I, if I'm competing against Joe, mom and mom, you know, Joe blow mom and pop, uh, for a first time home on an FHA on a, on a house that I'm going to put 25% down on a 20 year AM, um, and rent it, you know, by the month, uh, that's, that's hard to compete with when they're putting like basically zero money, yeah. three, three and a half percent down, but they're not going to look twice at the house with the terrible pictures. Um, uh, because they don't have the money for it. They don't have the well, money the to go fix whatever they don't have. Yeah. They don't have the time or energy for the rehab, they don't have the resources. So, and they don't need to cash flow and they've got a better interest rate than you do. So, yep. It's uh, and it's those a primary risk. markets. So, I kind of, you know, other people, you know, in, in long term rental, um, you're looking for that. You a thousand percent, you're looking for the, the dumpy house that you're basically just crossing off 70, 75% of your competition there. If they would have spent 15 grand, they could have gotten, you know, another 50, yeah, 40, 50 More. grand, you know, just on this random scenario, who knows we're making numbers up here, but, but you know, that, that also tells you that the seller is either not savvy enough to know that doesn't have the resources to handle that or more likely can't afford to do that, to, to put the 15 grand, you know, so that's, that's what you're looking for with long-term single family. And it, it does hold true. I think with all rental real estate, you know, same thing with apartments. If I'm going to look at an apartment building that this thing has like a beautiful, like a thousand dollar set of photos, um, it's completely full. You know, every unit is full. Um, it's got a brand new roof. It's got brand new washers and dryers. It's got brand new paint, brand new carpet, brand new LVP in the kitchen, whatever. I'm competing with every Joe Blow idiot on the planet to buy that. You know, it's like, let's say it's a 12 unit apartment building in Ohio, right? Uh, but if it's a dump, you know, with, None of that stuff. It's got a 40-year-old roof that's leaking. Uh, the It has no washer and dryer. One of the buildings is completely empty of the four buildings or whatever, however many. I mean, this is more, more than 12 units at that point. But uh, then, again, you're narrowing down your buyer pool, you know. So same thing goes with short-term. Um, I, dare I say it's maybe even less of an extent there on, on short-term than it is with the long-term single families because – 
in a vacation town, you're never really going to be competing with a first time FHA kind of a situation. That's that's no. a that's an advantage we have in, in vacation towns. You know, you're not competing with somebody that can to get this thing with a stupid low interest rate, well, the lowest available interest rate and 3.5 percent down. So uh, but that being said, with the nasty pictures and the nasty listing, um, a lot of times you are kind of weeding out like those fly by night kind of you know, like Instagram operators that just want it to be pretty and, and talk about it at the golf course, you know? Well, Uh, I I think you have, but it's on both sides. So the owner, no matter what asset class or property type, whatever it might be, uh, if the owner is savvy enough to have decorated it well, then they know what it's worth. Uh, If, if it's not, that also says a lot, not just about the house, but about the person. They haven't figured out how to value what they have. So the fa- the the vacation world example of that, well, and the agents involved too, because most likely they hired out for the pictures. So there's an agent in my market that always posts cell phone pictures. And I know that when he posts a listing, and he does a lot of them, that's always going to look better in person. I just know that it will. So I always pay attention to his because I know that it looks better than I think it does. Uh like you don't even notice that there's like full on wainscoting and like super nice crown molding. Cause it's just like a little blurry and you aren't, you have to kind of, it's that same thing where we were looking at the cabin. You kind of have to squint a little and okay. You don't just click, click, click and immediately see everything. You have to kind of search within the picture. Um, the other thing, and this is goes more of a, on the owner side is how it's decorated. So I went and saw a property uh, it was three or four rows to the beach. Uh, the view was way better than it showed in the pictures. Um, and they have the biggest, ugliest brown couch in the living room <laughs> and like fishing poles. Like it's open to the kitchen and along the wall where you go to the bar at the you know counter for the kitchen. There's just it's just like a line of fishing poles. And what I told the couple that I was showing is that. This house is kind of like a little black dress, okay? You could dress it up or you could dress it down. It's actually a very nice house, but they've dressed it down. So you could dress it up. Are were they the real, like, let's go fishing, fishing poles, not some sort of decoration? Oh, they were serious. This had to have been, there's no way there were less than 10 fishing poles on that wall. Hmm. I think they were keeping them in the house so they didn't get um, Rusty. rusted in the garage. So yeah. yeah. Oh, they were serious about it. Well, I've never probably, seen that many fishing poles inside of the house. Well, maybe they weren't renting it. You know, where they maybe they're just no. like, yeah. No, they weren't, but they also didn't get it ready to rent. Yeah, because that goes back to your point. Um, people that are really good at renting are gonna have the house has to be like rocking. If they're crushing it on their rental income, the house is crushing it on its own as far as the design and the upkeep and uh, appliances are in nice shape and the floors are in great shape. Everything's got to be really nice to get that tip top yeah. high end gross income, which when you go to sell gets you the high sell purchase price because the two are related. It's gorgeous. It's getting a high wrench because it's gorgeous. The purchase price and the rent is not what's related. I'm not saying that. Uh, but what I am saying is that the fact that it's getting those high rents is because it's gorgeous and ready to rock. And those are the same things that are going to get the high purchase price. So what I think it does in this market is let's say 10 homes are listed for sale just for the ease, just for simplicity's sake. If one of them is completely turnkey, uh, it will get the most attention and the other ones will get ignored when there's fewer buyers. It'll either be a price driven or turnkey driven. Hmm. And the people kind of in the middle where it's just so, so people just kind of ignore them because then, there's what, so many there, to pick from. Is there a strategy there? You go for one of those and go in with a lower offer and not, and don't get uh, heartbroken if they don't take it. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, they haven't maybe gotten any offers. You can see how many days on market they're lonely. They haven't gotten any offers. <laughs> They're getting a little desperate, maybe. I would say in vacation markets, people really don't get desperate the way clients would like them to. Mm-hmm. Buyer clients would like them to. Uh, what I tell people all the time is that 
you know, this is not a fire sale. Uh, the definition of a second mortgage typically is that they can afford two mortgages. That means they've got a good paying job and uh, that they can float both loans, their primary and this one. And this is what they do on the side. And if it doesn't sell, I'll also add in some beach mentality, uh, not quite on an island, but <laughs> it's the same mentality. Um, you know, if it doesn't sell by, you know, November, oh, we'll, we'll go spend one more Thanksgiving at the beach house or whatever the next upcoming holiday is. People are not in a huge rush, but people do still have their motivations. They may have decided that they want to do something else with their money, like buy a lake house, or maybe they have moved from Houston to Dallas and coming down to visit the beach just isn't as realistic for them anymore on a regular basis. So just their use has changed. Um, yeah. Stuff like a thousand that, percent. I, I agree. We, we've seen that since the beginning of time, you know, back when Avery and I first got into the vacation markets there, the market was dead. This was just, you know, um, post 2008. <laughs> and um, that was a period of time where, in the Smokies, which is where we started, we lived in Tennessee at the time. Tons of the cabins just had for rent uh, for sale signs in the in the yard, and they were renting them, but they had a for sale sign. And it was almost the vibe was kind of like this was when Avery and I first started shopping, like in 2014 or something. And the vibe was kind of like, um, you know, uh, the prices were high. They were almost like they were they were pre 08 prices. Um, and it was okay. almost kind of like they were putting a price on it. Like, Hey, if you're coming here to vacation with your family and you decide that you can't live without this house, it is for sale. But other than that, we're going to keep it, you know? Yeah. To your if point, there's no fire sale. They yeah, do not need to sell it by a 90 large. plus percent of people in vacation towns. They don't need to sell. It's a toy. It's a boat alternative and it's a much better investment than a boat. I mean, pretty much anything is a better investment than a boat, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, that is that you know used to be pretty typical back when the market was you know post 08 and it was before all this craziness i don't think we're going back to that but i do we are seeing more sellers that's a fact um than we were in the last two years and and i agree a lot agree. of people have realized this isn't their bag like they're they're not they're just not into it um something that i really think people should do is ask themselves have I ever, so when you buy a short-term rental, uh, it is not passive income, it's active income. Maybe here at the shop, we make things look too easy, <laughs> um, but it's also, it's all figure outable. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. Uh, it can be figured out. It's, are you motivated to figure it out? Are you willing to learn new systems? Uh, you're joining the hospitality industry. So do you like customer service? Have you ever done any level of customer service? Do you do you like interacting with the public? Because I've had a couple, I have a couple couple sellers right now who um, you know, they've owned their property a year or less, right around a year. And you know, that's an expensive mistake for them to get into this and think it'll be like a set it and forget it rotisserie chicken. And they realize they don't actually like property management. Yeah, well, I mean, we see that in all that. It's not just short term either, you know. So, yeah, uh, any of it. Yeah, fifty percent of all investment properties are sold in the first twelve months. Okay, so that's just. I mean, you got a 50-50 chance that you're going to dig it, you know. Yeah. And and long term, it's the same thing there, you know. So, um, and we saw a ton of people buy real estate in the past two years, so it's just kind of a natural thing that we're seeing a few more sellers right now. And and you do need to be careful. Uh, you got to make sure you got enough cash reserves to get you through the winter, um, and and, and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So let's talk about that. What 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 I, what do I need as a buyer to make sure that I can kind of weather the storm? So we're getting into end of uh, August, and you know, occasionally people will say, "Oh, I don't know if this is like the right time for me to buy. Maybe I'd rather buy in February." Um, you know, low season is going to happen during a 12 month calendar year, regardless of whether it's your first three months or your last three months in you know, the year that you own it. Uh, 
it doesn't really matter unless you're over leveraged and you don't have a safety net. So, I mean, it's going to happen. It's just, do you have personal reserves to take you through it? You can find deals in the off season that maybe there's less attention than in a high season. Yeah. In and other words, they've got practice months. time. <laughs> yeah. In other words, it's a 12 month cycle regardless. Right. So, yes. um, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. Like if you go in, if you get in live in January and like, cause you're in the beach, right? So let's take the beach. For example, you got all summer to make some dough and hopefully get enough nuts in your basket, like a squirrel to carry you through the winter. Now, some folks like, you know, we're seeing it now they're coming into the, their first winter. Um, again, we're recording this in fall of 23. And, and I think people, it's a natural tendency to kind of freak out or, on the other side of the coin is somebody who's looking to maybe buy, but doesn't want to buy right now because they don't want to carry it all the way through winter. And here's the deal. I mean, that money's either going to come out of the prop, hopefully the future profits of the property, or it's going to come out of your pocket. Either way, it doesn't change your net worth on paper. It's all your money at the end of the day. So it really kind of doesn't matter when you buy a home, but that is a big deal in the beach market, especially as we are now preparing for winter. Uh, that comes up a lot. And, and here's another point I'm going to make. There's no such thing as a better time to buy any real estate, um, even in a vacation market. If there was, for one thing, everybody would find out about it. And it would, like, let's say that November was the best time to buy a beach house because nobody's paying any attention and it's going to be dead for the next three months. That would make sense. Yeah. But if that was true, everybody would find out about it and nobody would yeah. buy beach properties in any other month except for November and it would drive the prices up in November. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, what I like to tell people right now is that prices are lower. Sellers are more negotiable than they ever have been. And, you know, ever have been in the last couple of years. Uh, and interest rates are the only thing that are working against you. So, you know, it, what is your in take some on ways it rates? is a good time to buy. Are interest rates going to change? In your I opinion, think I'd be paid a whole lot more <laughs> by do. someone really, 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 uh, you know, even outside of the shop, if I had the crystal ball to tell you what interest rates would do. I mean, I think we've reached a kind of a crisis point for a lot of, you know, primary home, homeowners because they're not going to cash flow on a property. Uh, and I think I read a headline the other day that said that we're at a 23 year, um, kind of a low of home affordability. So I think that the pendulum has swung mm -hmm. and I feel like surely it must swing back because at some point, I think the Fed is going to realize that this is not a social good that it be well, this a, way. And it's affecting the, 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 again, the people living in, in real estate as well, you know, because <laughs> Uh, you know, the house was, the, the house prices went up. Let's go back to that Kentucky example again. The price of that house last two, let's say three years ago was 95 grand. Then it went to 170 grand. And now it's 170 grand at more than double the interest rate that it was. So the 170 grand, even though it didn't make sense at three and a half percent or even 2% interest was back, we, we, it got that crazy, 2%. Now the sellers still want the same price as it was when it was at 2%. And I'm talking primary homes right now. Yeah. But the buyer is sitting there like, uh, dude, uh, you know, my monthly mortgage payment is the only thing that matters to me. And my monthly mortgage payment now compared to where it was with 2%, you got to lower it. Let's do some math on that. I'm not going to do the math, but I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, do the math. If you're out there listening, figure out what, $175,000 house monthly mortgage payment is at 2% versus 8.5%. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, whatever that difference is, you got to lower that purchase price to get it back to that mortgage payment to make the American people be able to afford to live life right now. You know, so I think it's definitely, you know, obviously a much bigger problem in the primary world, but uh, yeah. we, are, we are seeing it for sure. This episode is brought to you by Short-Term Rental Listing Advice. Join this Facebook group and post your listing to get advice from other hosts, including myself, on how you can improve your listing. Or 
Just post your property so you can show off. Join us at strlistingadvice.com. That's strlistingadvice.com. My, here, all right, let me get back to my uh, question, which was the interest rates. I'll tell you what I think. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think that they're going to level off here at eight and a half, maybe going to just barely touch somewhere in the nine range, but I don't think so. Um, and I think they're going to stay there for a while. I do. And I've been saying that for uh, quite some time. If anybody wants to test me on that, I, I think I did say peak at nine, um, like the day that they started doing this. Uh, which was what, I don't know, 14, 16 months ago or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I think honestly, and another thing I'll say, I feel like they're doing a pretty damn good job. Like the whole world could be way worse than what it is right now. And I'm not getting into politics in any way, shape or form here, but uh, there was a massive, massive world changing event that everybody seems to kind of try and forget about now. It's just forgotten about like the fact that we had to order groceries. And when they showed up at our house, we had to wipe them down with Clorox before we could open the packages and feed our children. Everybody That's forgets about that. Go there. I literally washed groceries. Yeah, I did it too. It was <laughs> scary like the whole time. Well. And I got, I'm one of those people that got the really, really, really bad COVID I was, oh, no. I was knocked out for six weeks. I had a, a fever of 104, uh, for, for like 20 days straight. It was insane. I was, uh, I was in really bad shape and I don't know that I ever got close to like, you know, like worrying about Luke not being here anymore. <laughs> Cause I am, you know, I take pride in a very, very physically fit individual, even though I'm getting up there, uh, but uh, I was, I'm one of those guys. I'm mean, one of those people that you heard about, you know, like this is what you hear about. Like, this is what it's, you know, so I went through yeah. that horrible, um, bad COVID you read on the news. Anyway, long story short, everybody just forgets about that. And they, they handled it by printing a bunch of money. I don't know if that was right or wrong. I probably wasn't right. You know, cause where I come from, you don't just hand the money to people, you know, but, um, but yeah, it but, felt wrong when I would get it. I'm like, so do I say like, no, yeah. but also like everybody else is going to say yes. It, it just felt like, why am I getting this money? Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't feel, it didn't feel right to me. Personally. For the record, I never got any, but um, so wh where was I going? Oh, so I think that, you know, all things considered, things could be way worse. Um, the stock market is like, what in the hell? It's like up, like massive swing. And I think that's the big problem. Not only are we having these massive swings, like every day, it seems like in the stock market, but back to your pendulum thing, the pendulum went so far one direction with real estate being on fire and the price is going up literally every day to the point where that thing almost damn near came and swung back around the other direction. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what grandfather happened. Grandfather clock. <laughs> yeah. Like a grandfather clock. And now it's gone all the way kind of the other way. Well, it could be a lot worse. I really kind of feel like it's more like at like, I don't even know which direction we're going, but just left of center well, or right of center. It didn't naturally adjust. I mean, this was, they adjusted it. They, it's yes. not like, you know, things just changed. It's that they uh, intervened specifically to cause a certain effect. And uh, I'm, yes, people are buying less houses. Um, yeah. So I feel like at some point um, it, they will have accomplished their goal and they won't need to take additional actions to reverse course or change the course and so i am hope hopeful that they will stop raising interest rates yeah i'm hopeful as well um but i kind of I, I, I don't i don't i don't think that i would never predict like oh yeah i think they're going down next month like i don't have any reason to think that so i am going to live in today's reality that interest rates are where they are and until I have good reason to think otherwise, I'm not banking on that that's changing. No, I agree. And, and I almost kind of don't want it to change. I think, I think change is what's our big problem right now. Uh, people don't handle change, uh, especially as many people as we're dealing with in the, this country. Um, you get that many people dealing with massive changes and there's fear. It creates fear. And I, I kind of 
hope that it stays pretty close to the way it is just for the sake of not changing so fast again, you know? Um, just for the sake, sake of stability? Yeah, we need a little stability in the world, in the market, in, the, in, the, in our lives. Like, let's just, can I just live my life, take my kids to school every day for a, a year and not have to wonder what's on freaking CNN or whatever channel you watch, you know? Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's scary, you know? So I don't know just for the sake of not changing so much, because that was our, that's our problem. We change the whole world changed two different directions completely in a four year period of time. So like two years we shut down, we couldn't leave our houses, uh, and they were giving us free money. And then the two years after that, they took away the free money and they're taking it back in the form of interest. Right. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's and property taxes, taxes and, and let's not forget about the damn insurance, you know? So, um, but again, you know, I, I, th I really think could, things could have been, could have been a lot worse. Let's, let's, let's shift gears a little bit here. Tell me about the, uh, your thoughts on the trident of real estate and, uh, uh, and cash flow in general. And then I also do want to hear some, you know, some of your, your tips on, on being, uh, it seems like you're a little bit on the conservative side of things. And I like that. We don't hear that enough, um, in, in real estate it seems, especially in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of get rich quick kind of junk going on. So talk to me about that. So something that I think gets posted a lot, cause I think, uh, you know, yes, we have a Facebook group and yes, people like to make posts, but they're, you know, and they are motivational. And I don't think that the people who are posting are necessarily trying to say, here's the great thing that happened and conceal what work it took to get there. Uh, and some people are really upfront about that. But I think it's easy to also even gloss over that, even if they've told you. So the trident of real estate. So there's three prongs. There's cash flow, appreciation, and then tax benefits. So in cash flow, you might hear somebody say that they cash flow this amount or they have this amount in their account after operating, you know, however many properties and whatever time period. And even if they aren't just being like, look how great I am. I did this so easy. Uh, you may not also be thinking about or realizing or even internalizing that uh, they spent two weeks massively doing an overhaul that costs 50 K because they bought, you know, some Ruby Poo property and made it awesome. <laughs> um, you know, they took a property that you overlooked and they saw value in. I mean, that's what it was for us with our cabin. We bought a grandma cabin on six acres. Um, and it, it was like doilies and dirty ivy. And I, it was a primary home for half a year. I moved someone's loofah out of a shower. So, I mean, it was an entire house full of furniture. I won't tell you what else I've moved out of that house, but an entire house full of furniture and all the other random shit that people leave. Uh, about the only thing of value that was in that house was the pool table uh, and like the washer and dryer. We've now replaced those. So maybe just the pool table. <laughs> um, but you know, we took it and we we worked so hard in the six days that we we had to take it from grandma furniture, like moved an entire house full of stuff out, moved an entire house full of stuff in. Um, and we were really proud of that before and after. But then we realized it wasn't booking like we expected it would. And we had to get real honest with ourselves about. Well, why? We had to take personal responsibility and say, oh, look at what other houses people could be booking. Kind of an enemy method situation. What are, what are their alternatives? So in looking at it, we're like, oh, ours is just basic. And people are passing ours up and booking these other cabins because they look way nicer. Like our baby was a little bit ugly and we had to realize that. it was. We were very proud of it, but, you know, needed some work. So projects that we thought we would get to later, hoped that we could just, you know, pull out of that cabin account when it built up. We realized that was going to happen as quickly as we wanted it to. And so, yeah, we had personal savings um, that we had put off to the side for years and years, how we bought the cabin to begin with. But we still had money in that account, not tied up in the deal that we could adjust. And now it cash flows and it does great. And people... 
we were always getting five stars because it's good customer service. But now the comments are totally different. It's like, wow, this place is amazing. Oh, it looks modern. It didn't look modern before. It looked like it looked just real basic. So we made a lot of changes there, but we could not have done that if we didn't have any kind of a safety net or money off to the side that wasn't already tied up in the deal. You can't operate with no margin for error. I agree. Yeah. You know, you don't spread yourself too thin um, uh, is, is the point there. Let me, let me ask you about that six acres. Did you, did you do anything with it or did you have any interest in doing anything with it or? So the six acres, uh, there's a three, two cabin on it. Um, the third bedroom is upstairs and it's like a, like it's a huge bedroom. It's as big as the two bedrooms downstairs and then a little extra. Um, and we just, we kind of, uh, it's pleasant acres. And so we kind of market it or kind of position ourselves as like a family retreat sort of place. And we always envision, I do, we do as the, that the upstairs is like a cousin hangout room. <laughs> And um, we don't really have anything specific that we've done with the place. Um, we have cleared a view so that we can see, um, gosh, what is it called? Bluff Mountain. There we go. Um, there is not really a defined trail, but we own all the way up. Like we're kind of in a, like a little valley and we all all the way up to the top of a ridge. So you can actually climb up to the top of the ridge. We're pretty sure there's there is a small cave on our property. We're pretty sure bears live in it. Um, there's a stream that runs through our property. Um, it's super private. Like the only thing you can see, you can see a little bit in terms of back neighbors, but I think you can see them. They can't really see you. And then from the front porch, you can only see when people drive. You can't actually see any other houses from our house um did you what, what about mini golf that seems to be all the rage with all that land i'm like thinking to myself what about did you look into that or did you did you have any thoughts on that no i mean in the last year we've redone the deck uh changed all the floor added decoration added like you know side tables beyond the basic stuff so we put a lot of money into the property it's looking well so I don't know that it needs it. Okay. You know, there's always the desire to do more, do more, do more. And at some point you have to ask yourself, well, will it, will it book differently? And maybe it would, but maybe that's a next year situation. I agree. I agree. Uh, I think there does need to be an end game. Yeah. Um, because when you get into this, especially if you're just, you know, one or two houses and you're watching TV shows, um, you could end up throwing your next down payment at a house you already own because you just didn't know when to quit. And at a certain point, there is a diminishing return on your rental income if you go too far. Um, and not that I wouldn't, not that I'm opposed to the mini golf idea. I just, when you no, say six I'm acres, not opposed to it. You know, but it does feel like we should do something. There is like a, um, oh, we did add a fire pit. We also re-graveled the whole driveway. Um, so we've we've done a whole lot there to bring it up to where we feel like our standard is. So right now it's at a high standard. We also changed out the railings. All the railings were like the wrong dimension. And we'd put like a hog wire over it <laughs> and just to make sure it was safe. And so yeah. we went back and did those things. And, that and looks we even way did like too. the oh yeah. Um so we've done a lot of improvements. We have thought about, well, what what if we add a cabin or tiny home? We'd have to get a um, like a change of use or whatever from the HOA to allow us to put another house on there and divide the land. Um, there is a cantilever barn at the front of our property. So it's kind of a cool thing to look at, but it's not anything you can go, you know, be near. It right. wouldn't be safe to climb in all that. So we have it fenced off. Did but, you, uh, did you cost seg this property or either of your properties and walk me through that uh, process? Would you do it again? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. I would love to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, we cost seg, uh, I think I pulled it. Yeah. So in 2021, that's when we bought our cabin, we did a cost seg with Yona Weiss 
and we had 149,664 in depreciation, which saved us 36K in actual money not paid to the government. Um, in 2022, the beach house was uh, 175K in depreciation. We used a different firm, it also had great results. It was a little bit less, but I mean, we got amazing results either way. Uh, and that saved us 42K in actual money not paid to the government. Um, I think some of that may have carried over from 2021. So it, we kind of, you, you bank like a, you bank some of that. Um, that also comes with the caveat. So it's one of those things like you hit the high note. Like I could post about that and say, oh, wow, look how much tax, tax savings I had. But if I get myself over leveraged somehow, and I need to go sell that property, guess what? If I'm not putting it into a 1031 exchange, please get your own tax advice. I'm so not an right. accountant. Yeah. Um, but I would then owe that money. If I'm not keeping that property or buying some kind of like kind, best I understand it, uh, property, then I am going to owe that money. I have to hang on to it. I don't know how many years, but a long time, which is great because I want to keep both properties. I love my beach house. And my cabin, unlike my cabin, uh, my beach house has actually cash flowed from year one or even month one. It doesn't always happen, but that one actually carried us through the remodels that we did with our cabin. Yeah, so, that's I something mean, to keep in mind. That's also nice. If you're going to do a cost seg, be careful. Uh, if you decide you don't like this in a year, you're going to pay all that back. You know, uh, again, we're not legal professional CPAs or, or any of that kind of thing here, but that is something to be aware of, you know. Um, so I see the same thing also with DSCR loans. If somebody, for whatever reason, needs to sell, say, say their property is doing great, but they have like a personal thing and they literally just need to have the lump sum money, you may be paying 5% or 4% in points as a prepayment penalty. And people really gloss over that that's a thing. Um, but it is. And People do need to calculate that risk. Do I have reserve? If something comes up, will I possibly likely be in a situation where I'll need to sell? And what would that mean for me if I got a DSCR loan and I did a cost seg? Yeah. I mean, Not thousand good. percent. <laughs> yeah. You, if you, yeah. If you're into this a year and you decide you don't want to do it anymore, you stink at it or what, whatever the case may be. Those are things that you need to be very aware of. You know, uh, what are you getting yourself into? Um, be careful who you're listening to on the internet and things like that, because uh, you can get yourself in a pinch, you know, but um, um, luckily I think we're, we're through the days of um, buying a house at the peak and then uh, interest rates tripled. And um, now maybe that house is not worth what it was when I bought it. Uh, I don't know. Um, so hopefully that those days are are not as much of a risk as they were. And we didn't know that was going to happen. Obviously, no. that was. <laughs> no, you could never. You could never know. I mean, I mean, are we better than the all of the economic people who do this every single day? Uh, I mean, no, they, no. no, And I mean, even those are predictions. You don't know if that will be reality just because they predict it. Um, even if they predicted it accurately, you know, hindsight's 2020, 20, right? Mm. Um, you know, like you've kind of been talking about in terms of price and the market, it's been a strange real estate market for the last few years. Um, kind of on that note of appreciation, um, I think probably the idea of holding a property and mentally holding a property like for about three years, like planning wise. Um, I think you should plan on holding it for at least three years if you think you're going to try to get out of it and walk away, you know, in the black between like real estate fees and loan origination and stuff like that. So do you have any recommendations I, as to how much money to keep in the bank as far as reserves are concerned? What, what do you do? <laughs> Whether it's a percentage um, or something like that? We have squirreled away money for years. Um, my husband and I have been married for 12 years and anytime we ever got a bonus, a tax return, uh, anything, any kind of money that we could afford to not spend, not even, we didn't know what we would do with it. We just squirreled it away for years. And um, 
you know, it was before we'd ever read about, gosh, what is the, I forget what it, what the book is called. I read it. Um, but it's basically where you squirrel your money away from yourself. Total money makeover, uh, Dave Ramsey? <laughs> no, it's not total money makeover. It's, um, I don't remember what it's called, but it was really good. Avery, I think, recommended it. Okay. Um, profit first. Oh, yes. profit first. Yes. Profit first. It's the idea that you're going to spend everything that you have access to. Um, and so we have always kept uh, bank accounts outside of essentially our operating income. So we say we we bank at Chase. So, you know, personal checking and savings and things like that, uh, things we might actually access on a regular basis are in there. And then we'll have investment accounts that you don't even see. So it's not money that in your head you think about that you could be spending. So um, I don't think there's a specific percentage. I think you save what you're able to, um, but be realistic. I mean, if you really want to do this and you, you do have to have a cushion. I mean, I had a buyer call me and they wanted to, you know, do a HELOC and I was like, oh, okay. I uh, will. And I was like, you don't have to answer this, but it was a random person, not a short-term shopper. Um, he said he'd wanted to do this for years to buy a short-term rental. And I was like, okay, well, what kind of like, he wasn't pre-approved. So I was kind of trying to get at, well, could you afford this house if you wanted to? I asked him about his personal savings and he was like, oh, well, I'm ba it's basically zero. And I was, I, I just was really wanting, I told him just really politely that I don't think that you can do this with no savings. You're going to get yourself in a bind. Um, there's work to be done before you just jump in like that. Like, I want all my clients to be better off with me financially than when they started. And um, I take it very personally if one of them gets themselves in a bind and that's not the case. And I try, you know, but I can't manage your property for you. I can't you know, attend a meeting with you during your office hours for them or know when it's time to do that. Right. So, uh, Which is a great time to plug that. Every Thursday, you can find me live on Zoom, uh, strquestions.com, strquestions.com. It's free and we uh, we have a good time. Um, yes. Now that I cut you off, I do want to ask another question about, you mentioned Chase. Um, uh, do you have Chase for Business accounts? Because they, uh, I did a lot of research on Chase for Business um, and, uh, it seemed to be pretty good option. Um, are you using that or just personal accounts? Uh, yes, I have the, so we have personal accounts with Chase and we have a whole separate login for our cabins business with Chase. And we talked about doing relay or whatever it is. And personal like, I can open up enough accounts here for free. That it's not a problem. It wasn't, he just didn't see the need to do it. And it was just more accessible in a system we already use. Um, and then I also use Capital One just to keep everything separated. I use Capital One for my real estate stuff. But you find the Chase for Business uh, does the job that it needs to. Do you uh, enjoy using it? It's uh, multiple bank accounts, easy, to, easy to, to, to handle? Yeah, it's been easy for us. But I think that some people want to have a whole lot more accounts than we feel is necessary. Um, my husband loves a good spreadsheet and all, but uh, he doesn't feel it's necessary to break everything down quite so far as I think some people like to do. So uh, it's it's been perfectly adequate for us. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, let's let's take it to the end here. Um, the you already mentioned two books, so Profit First. I'm going to ask you about books. Profit First, uh, Mike Michalowicz, and then you mentioned earlier. I would assume. I just happened to catch something. Um, I would assume it's because of a book. Uh, you said figure outable. Is that because of uh, Marie Forleo's book? Uh, Everything is figure outable. Is that where you got that? I from the title. I haven't read it yet. It's oh. on my list. But yes, I mean, it's like it, it's it's something that I. Yeah, you can figure out anything that you yeah. want to figure out if you have the desire, and you're willing you're willing to do it. The willingness. Um, I did read that book. Um, it is a huge book. Uh, it's very, very popular. And I, it's got like 15,000 reviews on uh, Goodreads. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I was surprised, quite frankly. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, I, I always, I kind of gravitate toward 
towards female off authors. I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. Um, and, uh, Mel, Mel Robbins. I'm, I'm, I'm in love with Mel Robbins. She's wonderful. Um, but, uh, I did like that book. Everything is figure outable. Not that she has anything to do with these other two authors other than the no, fact that they're okay. female, but, um, but, but yeah. Uh, any, anything else, any other books you're reading recently that you enjoyed? I just finished listening to, I won't take the full credit for reading it. I call that uh, reading. <laughs> I really do like reading a physical book, but I've decided that when it's for business, I'm just going to like do the audio for the most part. But if it's for personal enjoyment, I'll try to sit down and actually read a book because I'm dedicating the time to it, not just driving or something. Um, I just finished uh, reading Atomic Habits mm. and it was really good for me personally. Um, I am really not a great habits person. I need them. Uh, I need a schedule. Uh, I will also get like a week and a half, three weeks into some kind of a schedule or routine and just absolutely hate it <laughs> because I don't really like being that kind of restricted. I like just being able to kind of change it up all the time. But um, it's something I need in my life. So i I'm, I genuinely make an effort to do it and, and it, and it helps. Uh, that book was one of the best ones that I've read for me personally, recently. Yes. I uh, love that book. There are several books with the word habit in the title. Um, most of which, at least the huge ones I've read. And that one is fantastic. Uh, power of habit is another one. Um, the biggest one, at least to my knowledge would be uh, Stephen Covey, which is Seven Habits of uh, Highly uh, uh, Effective People. That's an older book. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jim Collins uh, did the foreword in that book, and Jim Collins is uh, is uh, one of the greatest of all time. He's not really an author per se, but a speaker, public speaker. More of a, anything Jim Collins is fantastic, even though he, again, just did the foreword on that one. But um, yeah, you got me in the book rabbit hole there all of a sudden with the <laughs> Atomic Habits. James Clear is the author on that one. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, the audio was good, too. Uh, I'm reading one right now. I'm reading never listening to never split the difference. But the audio is so um, stereotypical former CIA agent, CIA agent or what? I think that's what he is, um, that it's almost distracting. Yeah, it's he's like, like a tough guy. You're in a fiction novel. Yeah. Yeah, he's been on Avery's uh, podcast, uh, and uh, uh, he was fantastic. I got a lot of great pointers um, from from that podcast with Avery on uh, short term short term show. Um, the The thing that I picked up, and I've read his books. They, well, he's only got the two books, uh, but uh, the thing I picked only up two. Yeah, uh, the thing that I picked up. Well, you know, a lot of authors have a hundred. <laughs> the thing I picked up from Avery's podcast was. Um, uh, you're either the favorite, the favorite of the fool. I I think about that all the time now from that podcast on, on Avery's, uh, the short term show where, where the guy, uh, from, uh, the, the gentleman you're speaking of, he said in any situation in life, whether it's a sales transaction, which is usually what we're referring to here, at least with him, um, you're either the favorite or the fool and you should be able to tell right away. And ever since he said that it really clicked in my brain. There are certain people you talk to out in the world and they're looking at you like you're never going to be able to sell me what you're selling. And you're, you're, that means you're the fool, you know? Um, and somebody else is his favorite. So it's going to be very difficult for you to, to it probably just a lost cause. Anyway, the favorite and the fool I uh, picked up. This is a tiny little nugget there. Um, but uh, it reminds me of Grant Cardone. You're either selling or being sold to. Right. Sell it be sold. That's his first book. Uh, yeah, huge fan there. Okay, well, listen. I really appreciated his description of not just like selling, like you're actually selling things, but that the idea is that you're like getting your way in life, that that you are kind of like authoring your destiny and that you are, when you, winning doesn't just look like, you know, I raised somebody and we won or I made more money than this person and I won. It's kind of just, successfully getting your way in life, getting yep. the girl or 
go get the girl. You know, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. get the girl. That's a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, but anyway, it's been lovely. Um, and we can find you. Uh, well, you're on the short term shop team, so um, you can uh, find her at the short term shop dot com, or uh, we can email you, plug your email, or however you want us to contact you. Yep, uh, you can reach me anytime at Kelsey at the short term shop dot com. K E L S E Y. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. We love you. And uh, don't overthink it.